Okay, let's go ahead and get started with this evening's Master to Migration lecture series. Welcome to everyone who is here. We really appreciate you joining us in the evening. Um, with this lecture series, the Refugee Project Maastricht, the Maastricht Young Academy, and the Maastricht Center for Citizenship, Migration, and Development, as well as the UN Student Association and UNU Merit, aim to provide an objective picture on the topic of migration and offer new insights for the broader public. So that's really the purpose of these lectures. We hold them in general once a month during the academic year. And today we're extremely excited to have guests from the World Food Program and the International Organization for Migration who are going to talk to us about some very important and practical and topical um, issues going on right now. So specifically looking at populations at risk and the implications of COVID-19 for hunger, migration and displacement. So let me tell you a little bit about our distinguished speakers for today. So first we have Katarina Frappier. Katarina is a needs assessment consultant at the UN World Food Program, which is the world's largest humanitarian organization addressing hunger and promoting food security. In recent years, Katarina's work has focused on exploring the use of new innovative technologies to assess the needs and food security of people on the move. And in this regard, she co-developed the Migration Pulse Initiative in 2018, which uses innovative web surveys to give a voice to the displaced. Now, additionally, we have our colleague, Rafaela Robelin, who is a Senior Emergency Preparedness and Response Officer at the International Organization for Migration. And she's currently based at the IOM headquarters in Geneva. In the past decade, she worked in several humanitarian response and post-crisis settings, inclusive of large displacement crises, such as the post-earthquake post period in Haiti, Malawi, um, Northeast Nigeria, Bangladesh, Mozambique, Armenia, as well in, as in development contexts. She currently supports IOM's global efforts in support to preparedness and response operations in crisis settings. So two people here who really have a wealth of knowledge in displacement and crisis settings from two different uh, UN agencies. So really excited to have you guys here with us today. A bit of a note on housekeeping. So as the presentation goes along, please feel free to already ask questions in the chat as the, as the presentation is going along. So maybe you don't, don't forget your questions or other things like that. We love to see that engagement. Um, but also for more substantial questions or for you to be able to raise your hand and ask a question also without writing it in the chat, we're going to wait till the end for that and I will moderate that. So if you do have a question, either put it in the chat or raise your hand and we will do our best to get to you. Just so you know, this session is also being recorded, but we will make sure to stop the recording once it comes to the Q&A session in case anyone would have any concerns there. We do want everyone to be able to also speak freely and openly in the session. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to our speakers. Thanks again so much for being with us this evening. Thank you, Professor Siegel, for the very warm welcomes. Um, my colleague Rafael and I are really excited to be here this evening and hopefully foster some interesting and nice discussions around a topic that's uh, that's extremely timely and very important, which is the impact of COVID-19 on food security, migration, and displacement. Um, but before we get into the heart of the topic, I think what we can do here is first introduce a little bit better our, our, our organization. So as you mentioned, I work for the World Food Program, um, which is the headquarters are actually based in Rome in Italy. And um, this is the largest humanitarian organization. And what we do essentially is that we provide food assistance, but we're also working on improving nutrition and building a community's resilience. And so we're present in around 89 countries around the world and with 16,000 employees of which 90% are actually based in the field. And um, through the different programs that we do have, generally what we do is we provide either in-kind food, food or cash, cash-based 
uh, assistance. And last year in 2020, actually, we reached a record high. It's the first time we've reached so many people. And this was in the context of the global pandemic. We reached 114 million people. Um, and about one third of the beneficiaries of WFP are actually forcibly displaced. So they're actually refugees or IDPs, or in certain cases, also returnees. And this is the reason why um, migration and displacement is so important to us. And this is the reason also why we've been collaborating very strongly with IOM to be able to um, better understand what are the root causes behind that so we can better respond. So that's a little bit about WFP. I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Rafael, to tell you more about IOM. Yes, thank you so much. And hi, everyone. And again, also reiterating, it's a, it's a real honor to be here and uh, to contribute. Mm -hmm. So maybe a few words uh, about uh, IOM, which is also quite uh, an extremely large uh, operation that is actually uh, operating in over 160 countries. Uh, and we have over or close to 600 uh, offices globally. So um, IOM is, of course, a multi-mandated uh, organization, primarily uh, focusing on uh, supporting migrant, migrants and people on the move. Uh, that includes, obviously, displaced populations uh, refugees, but also migrants in very difficult uh, situation. Could it be for, you know, uh, smuggling, uh, trafficking, but also migrants compelled to move, as uh, we know, for instance, for the mixed migration flows, um, for the, the Venezuela crisis that we all aware of. So in terms of footprint um, and, and staffing, we over 15,000 staff and not necessarily accounting for non-staff, meaning uh, associated uh, people working with the organization. And it's also an organization that, you know, primary aim as well is obviously to be able to work and contribute and support the member states. We have over 173 member states and uh, support the resilience and empower peoples on the grounds. So um, it's really an organization working across uh, what we generally call the, the triple nexus nowadays, but the spectrum of both the humanitarian crisis and post uh, crisis setting as well, as well as in terms of development, but also in terms of peace building to address the root cause of uh, migration and displacement. Just to give you an idea of um, footprint and just from the humanitarian component in 2019, uh, it was 28 million people who are directly reached or support. Uh, supported by uh, IOM and in terms of data and evidence, um, IOM is uh, playing a key role in terms of assessing the needs of both migrants and displaced population. So we had um, a situation back to 2019 where over 80% of the global humanitarian planning and the country humanitarian response plan uh, were using um, IOM uh, displacement data to generate uh, the planning. So those are a few words uh, about uh, the organization that allow us obviously um, to do this joint publication and uh, explaining as well, um, you know, the scope and putting the, the scene for the presentation today. Over to you, Katrina. Thank you, Rafael. Sorry, I'm just trying to change my slide here. Okay. Great. So why are WFP and IOM working together? I mean, um, well, actually, the question is, is quite, the answer to this question is actually quite simple, is the fact that there are very strong linkages uh, between um, food security, migration, and displacement. And actually, in 2016, this is when I first, first joined, joined WFP, we were conducting a big study together also with IOM on trying to understand what role did food security play in uh, as a key driver of my, in international migration? And what we found is that food insecurity, often when it's combined with conflict, with violence, and with other type of disasters, can actually be an adverse driver that compels people to leave their homes. And when we did the macro level analysis using secondary data, we found that for every 1% increase in hunger, actually an additional 200 out of 10 10,000 people will be compelled to leave their homes. Now, at the same time, what we also know is that safe 
orderly and regular migration and humane migration can actually bring a lot of benefits to communities. The benefits to communities of that are hosting the migrants um, through migrants' participation in economies, but also back to communities of origin, mainly through remittances. And so, you know, we really, um, what we're trying to do here and why we joined forces is really try to better understand, okay, what are the main drivers of migration and displacement? And how can we tackle these root causes to make sure that migration is always a choice and never an act of desperation? Food insecurity should, and conflict and violence it should not be pushing people away from their homes. So that's essentially what we're what we're advocating as as the agencies and what really brought us together to work even closer, both at the field level, so in the in the in the direct at country level, at regional level, but also at global level. Now, the joint uh, report that we're going to be <laughs> presenting this evening, is, I mean. It was a, when COVID-19 hit, it was really when the lockdown measures started being implemented here in Italy, we were also one of the first ones who we knew, we knew that this was going to have huge impact on mobility and that it was eventually going to have impressive and socioeconomic impacts and directly impact people's food security. And so um, at the same time, we have, as we just explained, a lot of people on the field, on the ground, who are collecting information. So we joined for forces at global level, benefiting from the, the consistent data that was being collected also in the field that were allowed, giving us an insight on how the food security and the mobility situation was, was evolving. Uh, throughout the pandemic, and we decided to articulate the research on looking at what would be the implications on the food security, um, uh, the implications, excuse me, of COVID-19 on migrant workers, on three groups, on migrant workers, households who depend on remittances, and displaced populations. And the, the study is actually divided in kind of two sections. So you have a section that is looking more at um, Kind of the macroeconomic uh, situation. So we analyze a lot of secondary data that was available. And then we made use of a lot of the information that was being collected in the field and we highlighted what was the situation in some of the um, major migration and food security hotspots around the world. And I think in total we're covering in this report around 28 countries. So if you have an interest in a particular country to see how the situation uh, was at the time or how the situation evolved, you can go in and, um, and have a look. <clears throat> so that being said, let's get in, <laughs> let's get right into it now. Um, okay, so this slide is showing you basically the situation uh, on hunger and migrate and displacement, excuse me, um, when COVID-19 hit. So this was the global situation. The number of people in urgent need of food assistance was growing consistently over the past four years. So in 2019, across um, 55 countries, there were 135 million people that were uh, suffering from acute food insecurity, meaning that these people don't know where their next meal is coming from. And the main drivers of food insecurity <clears throat> at the time were con mainly conflict, climate shocks and economic crisis or economic downturns in these countries. Now, at the same time, we had the global trends on displacement. Um, this is just showing you due to conflict and violence, but there's also a lot of displacement that's happening due to, um, due to, due to sorry, this is showing conflict and violence, but there's also a lot happening due to climate. And um, so in terms of displacement, it was also a record high. It had been consistently growing the, the number of displaced populations since 2011, arriving at a record height of 79.5 million. And then you can, you can add on top of that actually another 5.1 million people that were displaced due to, due to, due to climate. And we we're just looking at the, the main figures, uh, the, sorry, the recent, well, most recent figures. And this shows by mid 2020 that the number actually reached 80 million. So this was the situation <laughs> prior to COVID-19. And of course, when the pandemic hit, you know, it really had an impact. And actually, WFP projected that the number of food insecure could actually double, um, so reach about 270 million people uh, due to the socioeconomic impacts of the of the um, of the pandemic. So now I'm going to switch 
to Rafael, who's going to talk to you more about the global migration landscape at the time when you started the study. Yes, so thank you so much, Katrina. Maybe also to add uh, on uh, global migration trends. Um, so at the time of writing the report, um, and if you looked at the report, you will see that we're using the figure of uh, 272 million people who are um, migrating, uh, either internally or you know cross border, and that includes as well uh, you know the forcibly displaced population as for the refugees. But the most recent figure that was uh, just released actually, um, indicates that for now we have over 281 um, million uh, international migrants um, as of now, as of 2020. And so what is quite uh, interesting as well uh, to say is, um, so about one third of them uh, are actually living in low and uh, middle income uh, countries, so 35%. And what is um, actually quite key uh, if we look at uh, the um, overall migration trends is when we also look at the linkage between uh, migration and uh, also remittances. So if you look at the global stock of uh, official uh, remittances, uh, you will see that at the moment we have close to 800 million people who are depending on the remittance. So it's really a lifeline um, for people in the world. And so prior to the pandemic, uh, the global official remittances, and here again, we're just accounting for figures uh, recorded um, on the official, official channels, they peaked at uh, over 700 um, billion in 2019. Out of this, um, over 548 billion were received uh, by families living in low and middle and middle income country. So you would see, you know, general migration trends, uh, of course, and so in particular also the the migrant workers, um, you know, going, um, you know, internally or externally, and uh, playing a critical role um, in sending back uh, remittances um, to those uh, families. So. Um, if, if we now look at uh, the general you know, trend as well, and so the 164 um, million international uh, migrant uh, workers, maybe one key point uh, also to note is that the majority of them are not necessarily uh, crossing uh, borders. Um, maybe next, Katrina. Good. And just also to um, reiterate a bit on uh, the global displacement uh, landscape and to really complete uh, the pictures. And so as mentioned earlier by Katrina, if you look at the number of people who were displaced uh, by conflict and violence, this figure has been growing uh, consistently. So um, there's more conflicts everywhere, everywhere, more insecurity and people are constantly on the move. And obviously the year 2020 uh, has been uh, quite uh, strong uh, yeah. with lot of uh, violence uh, erupting. So by the end of uh, 2019, and those are the officially recorded figure um, from uh, the IDMC, we had over 50 million IDPs, which uh, included the 45 million um, people internally displaced by conflict and another 5.1 million who remained um, in need of uh, and search for more durable solution and were displaced due to um, natural hazards and disasters in itself. We generally are a bit cautious about uh, the figure of uh, 5 million of uh, IDPs um, remaining in need uh, and displaced due to uh, natural disasters, because this is an end of the year figure. If we actually look also at the new displacement on a yearly basis, we generally have an average over the past 10 years, over 23 million people every year on average uh, that are displaced by displacement. However, considering that natural hazards are also chronic, you know, at the end of uh, the year, many people also find a, a solution to a certain extent. Does it mean that um, they necessarily find a durable solution to their displacement? Not necessarily. But this is just to give a bit uh, the caveat um, by on this figure. Next. And Yes, Katrina next. Yes, and so the third key component um, also, you know, to really continue setting the scene uh, also for um, 
for this is also to look at uh, the change in mobility uh, during 2020. So, um, you know, when we look at how the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting the mobility both for you know, migrating population, the figures that we ju just presented uh, before, but also for displaced uh, population. Well, you can see from this infographic that if you compare the data from um, the beginning of uh, 2020 to the end of uh, uh, to 2020, that uh, the COVID-19 um, measures that were put in place. So we we look at uh, border closures, we look at uh, you know visas, we look at uh, the various containment measures, as really dramatically uh, reduce uh, the possibility and ability um, for people to move. So therefore, um, absolutely uh, affecting uh, human mobility in general, which certainly had a major, major impact on uh, general uh, well-being. So maybe next. And so if you then look at all these um, parameters, um, technically, the equation and the analysis um, that we've been doing in um, in our report is actually quite simple. So, COVID nineteen has significantly reduced um, the capacity of people uh, to move due to the um, the containment measures that were in place. So, back to October two thousand twenty, for instance, we had over and we compiled uh, data um, for over two thousand nineteen countries, territories, and other areas that had international entry restrictions or condition um, for entry. And so those uh, containment measures that were in place, they caused uh, the migration change uh, to shift uh, quite significantly. So with a change in uh, mobility, that also includes uh, an induced uh, reduced uh, remittance flow because people and especially migrant workers who are generally the first one to be uh, affected and also losing uh, and left behind and losing their job. As we know, COVID-19 has uh, significantly um, generated lost and major um, job opportunities. They are therefore not necessarily able to send uh, remittances. Then at the same time, because of the mobility restriction, a significant number of people were actually forced to return. So we saw, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, major return of people um, in areas and also in um, low to middle income countries and, and therefore generating as well more stress um, and difficulties and having more difficulties to cope with the situation and not being able anymore to provide uh, for their family. And as a result of that, um, we would we expect that, of course, it has an immediate impact on the well-being of the population, including the food um, security, but then it can also generate in the long term and creating conditions forcing and compelling people as well to move out of uh, necessities. Next. So maybe just to be very, very concrete, because beyond um, the broad figures, um, we have also um, you know, human and life and uh, difficult uh, conditions on the ground. So just to take uh, the case of Afghanistan, uh, for instance. So in um, Afghanistan, um, as you know, a lot of people migrating uh, out of uh, Afghanistan and the main destination countries uh, being Iran and uh, Pakistan. So in terms of displacement and in terms of uh, movement of population who are forced to flee um, Afghanistan, we have over or close to 3 million Afghan refugees uh, that are recorded and an additional 4.7 million internally displaced population, primarily due to the conflict, but also the climate shocks. Um, not to forget also that Afghanistan is affected uh, quite periodically um, by uh, natural hazards. So right at the start um, of uh, the, the pandemic uh, last year, when the containment measures and the border closures uh, were announced, we saw major spikes of returning migrants. So between March and April last year, we had, you know, in a bit over one month, over 160,000 undocumented 
and uh, Afghan nationals who return, return homes, uh, mainly from Iran and uh, Pakistan. So when you look at the general trends and um, the first return of population back to Afghanistan because of pressure because of the loss of job and also opportunities, but also the extremely difficult conditions in the countries where they were migrating to. We have over close to 700,000 migrants who were back to Afghanistan uh, by November 2020, and then therefore creating a significant uh, impact and more difficulties. It is also difficulty as well to reintegrate uh, for the mi migrating population. And those obviously are being um, coming back because of the loss of work, the reduced wage, um, but also the lack of uh, medical services uh, as well. We had also cases of you know, discrimination and uh, stigmatization as well that is compelling people and forcing them also to come back, but also some uh, pressures from authorities. Next. And maybe to be also uh, quite uh, close also to the reality and another country that is affected by a multidimensional uh, crisis. And this that is also a country of uh, origin um, and transit, but also destination uh, for migrant is the case of uh, Libya. So in Libya, um, we actually noted uh, in particular uh, last year that the stock of migrants uh, in Libya had fallen by 9%, um, you know, if you compare from uh, one year to one year, meaning that we had an estimated last year 80,000 migrants who left uh, Libya uh, since uh, the start of the pandemic. And so at the same time, we had the number of registered arrivals uh, to Malta and Italy, and people also so either coming from Libya or transiting from Libya, that more than doubled uh, between uh, January and September 2020, if we compare to the same period in 2019. And so in the specific case uh, of, um, of Libya, we had um, obviously main drivers of uh, migration that were, you know, loss of livelihood, obviously uh, the insecurity and the difficult uh, conditions um, in Libya, but also, you know, also having pushing people uh, to take more perilous uh, journeys um, because of the tightened um, security, but also more difficulties, um, you know, on the migration uh, journeys. Katrina, over. Thank you so much, Rafael. Um, great. So I'm really sorry, my computer has a hard time changing the slides for some reason. Okay, here we go. So um, that was great. I mean, so we've understood now a little bit what was our framework for the study, uh, looking at how COVID-19 has impacted both mobility, but also um, and how this is also linking into impacting people's well-being. And uh, as Rafael mentioned, migrant workers were, were very much affected. And now we're going to turn to remittances and remittance-dependent uh, households, actually. So it was mentioned, um, I mean, I'm just remittances are the monies and sometimes goods that people will send back, either migrants or the diaspora community will send back to uh, countries of origin, either families and countries of origin. And as we mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation, um, remittances really reached a peak in 2019 with uh, over 700 US billion dollars that were sent uh, across the world, of which 76%, so 548 billion US, uh, US billion dollars were sent to low and middle income countries. Now, generally when uh, families receive these in countries of origin, they would use remittances to cover for their basic needs, more more or less. So uh, these we you know this could be to, to cover food needs. It could be to cover education needs. It could be to cover um, medical medicines or medical services, rent, shelter. It's also a really good insurance against risk in case there's a shock. Um, so there's a really strong relationship between actually remittances and food security. And we'll try to illustrate that for you. But one thing that I wanna mention here is, well, two things actually. So the first is the fact that um, due to the socioeconomic implications of the pandemic, the World Bank is actually predicting that um, 
the remittances could decrease by 14% by 2021. So you actually see here in this graph, the forecast of decrease in 2020, and then the following forecast of decrease in 2021. And based on this, uh, WFP, we were able to uh, um, insert these figures and come up with how many people, you know, could be at risk of facing food insecurity due to the loss of remittances. And that ends up at 33 million, an additional 33 million people could be at risk of hunger due to this. Um, but I want to il illustrate this in a way that's a little bit more clear. So um, as Professor Siegel mentioned at the beginning of the, of the, of the presentation, I <clears throat> Um, have been working on a project called the Migration Pulse, and we've been using innovative technologies to assess the situation of people on the move, but also of families left behind. And this, in 2019, we um, did a research in Nigeria, actually. And this slide, these are two kind of key indicators that show you very, very close links between food security and remittances. On one end, families who receive remittances in Nigeria um, are using these mainly to cover, as I just mentioned, education fee, food needs, rent, medical treatment, and other types of, 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 uh, of, service, of other types of things. And on my right, if you look at the, the graph here, what's really interesting is that <clears throat> there's, a, there's a clear difference in terms of food consumption between those who receive remittances and those who do not receive remittances. So, out of the, those who receive remittances, you see that 35% um, are actually eating three meals or more, <clears throat> and about 47% uh, in 18, 47% are eating two meals or more. And uh, who, those who do not receive remittances, um, there's you know the the are are consuming actually less uh, less meals on a daily basis. So there is a very close connection between the two because people are using this these types of of um, in this this income to meet their main needs, their main food needs. Um, okay, now if we go up the continent, so from Nigeria to Libya, um, so actually in Libya, the Nigerian migrants make up for an important group of, of the migrants in, in Libya. And in Libya, we work very closely together with IOM and we're doing again, the Migration Pulse project. And here we assess the situation in 2020. So the data was collected, um, maybe it was collected towards the end of 2020. And what we looked at is we tried to understand here, <clears throat> what was the situation in terms of livelihoods? So the first graph shows you that migrants IDPs here have had a significant change in their income compared to a year ago. And the main uh, reasons that they stated was really the COVID-19, um, the insecurity and the conflict, or a combination of both. So migrants in IDP, migrants 17% lost their income, um, and IDPs around 18% compared to the previous year. And the food security situation at the same time of migrants in Libya is actually really concerning. So we have almost half of migrants that reported recently that they're very concerned where their next meal would be coming from about one third that are consuming one meal or less and 44% who are adopting livelihood coping strategies um, due to the lack of food or the means to buy food. So lively, a coping strategy would be, for example, you know, borrowing money uh, from food or, or borrowing money for food or um, you know, sleeping on the street instead of, of paying for shelter, this type of thing so that they can afford their food. So with this situation, taking this situation in, um, into consideration, what happens is that while there is going to be an impact on the ability of these migrants to be able to send remittances back home, which brings us back to our loop actually of the impact that this is, would have on their families left behind. So this is showing you, and this is really interesting, fascinating, <laughs> I find anyway, um, that in 2019, actually two thirds of migrants were sending remittances back home. And in 2020, this dropped to about half that were able to send remittances back home. The use of remittances also shifted a little bit. So you can see that 19% um, of, uh, of migrants reported that they were sending these remittances for their families to be able to meet their food needs, followed by education and shelter. 
And I think when we did this, the previous round education was always coming up at the top. Um, at the same time, we also asked them about their change in capacity to send remittances since the outbreak of COVID-19. And this is, it's interesting to see that about half are either, have either stopped completely sending or are sending less. And out of those who are sending less, 46% uh, said that they're reducing their transfers by more than 50%. So we really see that the, the, the loss of livelihoods inside the country the whole situation, you know, compounded also by the very particular situation in Libya, which is the, 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 the constant insecurity and also the conflict, um, has really decreased the ability of migrants to be able to send money. And maybe one more note on this is the fact that um, actually migrants are shifting in terms of, so you can send remittances through formal or informal channels. So formal channel would be bank transfer, it would be, I don't know, Western Union probably. Um, yeah, and then an informal channel would be um, a private agent, for example. And so what we're seeing is that there's also been a shift because those informal channels are not so available anymore. People are starting to send more uh, through formal channels, which eventually may lead to kind of a false uptick in, in the, the official remittances. But we can talk more about that <laughs> um, if you have questions on this after the, the presentation. So this is a little bit the situation on remittances and food security. And we are very concerned about how, you know, the loss of remittances is going to impact um, families and countries of origin <clears throat> and their food security, especially. Um, okay, now in terms of how COVID-19 has also uh, had an impact on displaced populations. Um, so just maybe as a premise here, displaced populations, so IDPs and refugees were already living in countries prior to the pandemic that were, you know, in very in, in dire conditions. So four and five displaced actually live in countries with high levels of food insecurity and malnutrition. And at the same time, nine in 10 countries with the largest number of IDPs experienced major food crisis in 2019. Now, the other thing I want to mention here is that the majority of the world's displaced actually live in urban areas. So it might be a misconception to think that they, they live in, most of them live in camps. It's actually that they're living in urban areas. And a lot like the um, migrant workers, um, they work in the informal sector, and they're often the first to lose their jobs during times of crisis. They have very little protection against um, dismissal, especially women and um, younger populations who are very overrepresented in the, in the informal sector. And at the same time, refugees and either IDPs, whether they're living in camps, camp-like settings, urban areas, they're often living in very crowded environments, which are putting them at very high risk of um, actually contracting the virus. So uh, because they cannot implement things like physical distancing or masks or frequent hand washing. Um, now to illustrate this a little bit, we've done again, <clears throat> this is through our Migration Pulse project. Um, we looked at the implications of COVID-19 on Syrian refugees in Lebanon. And as I just mentioned to you, so the, the, we looked at, first of all, what was the change in employment status since COVID-19? And this is incredible. Like, say 52% of Syrian refugees reported losing their jobs since, the, since COVID-19. And, um, and this compares to about one, one third of Lebanese uh, residents. And so this is extremely concerning. And if we look on the other side, of course, when you lose your livelihood, then it really becomes difficult to start meeting your needs, right? Um, and so the proportion of the population who's worried about having enough food to eat really increased. Syrian refugees, it went up to 75% in 2020 when we did the survey compared to 60% in 2018. And for Lebanese, almost half of Lebanese or half of Lebanese residents are actually feeling worried about not, ha not having enough food compared to 31% um, in 2018. So this really shows you that <laughs> the implication and, and what's going to happen or what could happen is that, and this is was the triangle that Rafael showed earlier is that as people are having a harder time 
to meet their needs or to ensure their well-being, not just food security, but other also other basic needs. You know, there is a worry that there may be an increase of migration as a coping strategy to be able to go and meet those needs. So on this note, I think I go to Rafael to speak about more the protection side. Over yes, this. thanks so much, Katrina. Maybe Another side that is actually critical when we're looking at the implication of COVID um, on the life of migrants and uh, displaced population is really in terms of uh, protection. That is extremely concerning, um, obviously, and uh, protection risks uh, that are being exacerbated quite dramatically uh, because of the crisis. So because of the pandemic uh, and, you know, obviously, there's always a lot of protection uh, needs uh, associated um, with uh, forced displacement, but also with uh, migration. If it's not necessarily, you know, um, organized or, or regular, I would say. But uh, what we've been seeing is uh, increased risk of. Uh, evictions, uh, primarily as well because of, you know, the loss of uh, job as well, knowing that a lot of people, you know, either migrants or displaced population can sometimes live in very informal um, um, ways and houses, and therefore putting them more vulnerable um, to the risk of evictions, um, leading also to other risk of uh, exploitations, but also gender-based violence, uh, and in some cases, extremely concerning reports of uh, increasing trends uh, in terms of uh, child marriage, all also linked uh, to, you know, reduced op opportunity as well to cope, um, also with uh, the crisis, but also very and worsening conditions. Um, again, knowing that the majority of uh, the, the majority of countries in the world have been uh, faced by, you know, ser serious um, um, restriction measures as well that you know have affected uh, dramatically people, and so therefore increasing those. Um, what we saw as well is that uh, COVID-19 with the international border closure as well, uh, more visa restrictions as well, have been pushing migrants who are in vulnerable, in vulnerable situations. And again, a lot of uh, migrants, um, you know, moving or being compelled uh, to move uh, because of uh, political disturbances, uh, socio-economic conditions, and more and more being seen into embarking into more dangerous uh, migratory journeys. No, I mean, and it's not necessarily uh, just the, the situation in the Mediterranean, and uh, this is across the world. It's being seen also in the Horn of uh, Africa, where um, the mixed migration flows, meaning, you know, the, the movement uh, of people um, in, with different legal status um, have been uh, noted in this in this area, and more migratory journeys uh, were seen, um, and including or not including, uh, sometimes with uh, dramatic um, consequences. What we saw as well is uh, an increase in uh, xenophobia and uh, discrimination, um, which has been spreading and consolidating um, with the idea and misperception that people on the move uh, may be carrying uh, the disease, which is, you know, similar to all any other epidemics or the pandemics. But really COVID-19 has been exacerbating the pre-existing grievances, the stigmas, and also community division. And so that has been leading to increased discrimination against mobile and displaced population who have been perceived as foreigners and also disease carriers. We had uh, many occurrences um, also in India, uh, for instance, also again in Yemen, but in many other areas uh, of the club. And last but not least, another critical protection concern is really in terms of uh, misinformation, or at least, uh, and also the lack of uh, information, um, in particular for, you know, the more vulnerable uh, minority groups and marginalized populations. When you look at people on the move and, uh, again, migrants uh, or, or this place, uh, they do not necessarily have uh, the timely information about uh, the different restrictions or information about accessibility um, regarding uh, services. And sometimes uh, those that are be left uh, behind and not necessarily included into the national public health measures um, or do not know how and where as well to access uh, those 
schools. So those are major trends um, and issues that were also noted, uh, not uh, completely you know, inclusive, uh, obviously, uh, but as has been extremely worrying um, at global level. And so based on that, uh, maybe Katrina, next slide, um, you know, with all of that and looking at all the data and in particular the joint work uh, between IOM and WFP, the two organizations um, decided to put the joint call for action, a joint call to action, and to really asking, um, you know, to also government, but the international uh, community as well, and also, you know, looking at private sectors. I saw on the chat a question about remittances. Um, and we've had critical um, actions and uh, recommendation to be taken in order to mitigate uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the most vulnerable and also migrant population, but also, also to switch the, the narrative um, and also ensure that uh, people on the move and migrants, um, you know, it is understood that they can also absolutely contribute uh, to long-term recovery. So the first recommendation and the call to action is um, to ensure that migrants facing acute hardship can access humanitarian assistance in order to meet their food and um, other needs. So here we're speaking about um, you know, those cases uh, of um, uh, migrants in extremely difficult population, um, we, you know, recorded over 3 million migrants that were stranded uh, and could not return home and didn't have possibility to come back or to move elsewhere because of the, the international and the travel restriction measures. And, you know, many people as well uh, lack the capacity to support themselves as well. And, you know, the key message here is really to ensure that in the response that is provided, you know, for this specific crisis and in general as a crisis, um, that this response is need-based um, and not necessarily looking at the migratory status. So really looking at the needs of population. The second key uh, recommendation that was put forward uh, by the two organizations is to safeguard the assistance provided to the displaced population and their host communities. So including the refugees and asylum seekers, the IDPs, but also looking at migrants in crisis situation and um, those in uh, mixed flows. Um, so here we particularly also looking at the fact that during the crisis and the pandemic, um, at least from a humanitarian perspective, it has been increasingly more difficult um, to also reach people and um, you know access has been also reduced, even importing goods, even you know going to some location where we know people are in acute needs of uh, humanitarian assistance. Um, mobility and internal mobility movement uh, have not uh, always uh, been possible. And so here it's quite also important that, you know, from the assistance that is also provided, um, you know, from government to make sure that the, those people where we're speaking about life-saving assistance can really access um, this and that that can be provided to them. The third recommendation was um, also to secure the access to critical services um, and also to provide increasing uh, information for um, people on the move, uh, on the move here again, uh, migrants uh, and uh, displaced population. Um, again, here we're also speaking about, you know, ability and uh, knowledge of availability of services. For uh, recommendation is um, the real need to recognize the positive contributions of migrants and diaspora um, and also promote their inclusion in social protection system. What has been seen as well with the pandemic is, um, you know, the impact in the long term in terms of uh, the socioeconomic uh, context. It's quite critical because we rely so much on human mobility. If you look at seasonal uh, agricultural workers, if you look at the frontline workers, uh, 
a lot of them are also migrants. So migrants are an essential uh, resource. Um, the fact that human mobility was uh, reduced is also one of the factors of the difficult socioeconomic conditions um, that are happening now globally as the, the general impact uh, of uh, the crisis. And for us, it's quite critical uh, to ensure that uh, this is uh, recognized, but also that the support that uh, migrating population can do in countries, um, regardless, you know, countries of um, uh, internally as a country of origin or destination and transit is recognized and that they are included in uh, the recovery planning because they play a major role and that includes as well diaspora who are, uh, you know, generally also one of the first uh, provider uh, of assistance and playing a role in the development uh, of their communities and their country. Next. Another, um, the, the fifth recommendation was uh, really looking at um, the facilitation of the flow of remittances. So it is important to, that remittances are recognized as an essential financial service that supports the response and also the recovery. So here we're looking at, um, you know, if remittance service providers can be incentivized uh, to reduce, for instance, the transition costs and also enable easier access to remittance uh, transfer channels. And this is within the context of uh, general um, reduction as well in the term of economic opportunities uh, for migrating population. And so to continue allowing as well uh, them to send and support uh, the families from their communities of origin. The next recommendation is uh, to promote the necessary adjustments to national legal frameworks and also ensure access uh, to legal services. So it's important also to enable migrants to remain in compliance uh, with immigration rules um, for, for them to be able to access and or continue to have access to legal services, but also to safeguard the right for them to safely return, uh, return to the areas of origin that has been um, quite impacted um, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we look at uh, the specific cases um, of which policy measures uh, can be done uh, to include the extension of expiring visas, um, renewed work permit and residence permit, uh, for instance, and also what type and specific strong recommendation that uh, special attention should be given to the undocumented, undocumented migrants. Um, the seventh recommendation um, was related to xenophobia, stigmatization and discrimination. So counter the narrative, um, counter this narrative uh, in the wake of uh, COVID-19, some key steps that can be taken, um, they do require sensitization uh, of the general public, you know, in every uh, countries, and also really, really strong efforts to counter the public disinformation, but also fear and prejudice uh, against people people um, who are on the move. And last but not least, um, a key recommendation that is also um, you know, one of the key areas of work of all, all both organizations, but, you know, regards um, both government and the international community, is really to continue improving data and analysis to better understand the impact of COVID-19 on mobility, the remittances and the food security dynamic. So, it has been increase, increasingly difficult uh, during uh, the pandemic to sometimes also continue and carrying a needs assessment. Needs assessment are extremely critical to understand and, and to inform evidence-based response, but also policy um, and also direct uh, assistance uh, to affected population. So, you know, there are uh, possibilities to continue investing in innovative remote monitoring uh, and, uh, and assessment. Um, I mean, we, for instance, uh, in both as uh, IOM and um, NWFP, we've also been doing that uh, in some uh, many contexts, but also making sure that the angle of the long term impact and also the impact on, you know, the peace and the stability um, of in countries is also measured because the, the impact and consequences of uh, COVID will be also long-term um, and 
it's quite important to be able to measure that so we can better inform uh, global policies as well, but really um, also extremely importantly, respond better and uh, appropriately to the needs of those that are affected. I will stop here with uh, the recommendation. Um, and of course, we remain available for any other questions. <laughs>